Good morning and welcome to the launch of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 or SMA 2020, a joint venture by Scottish Government, Nature Scott, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for Scotland. Before going any further, can I thank Hannah Ladd Jones and colleagues at Mass for hosting this very special event this morning. Thank you very much. A quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, we uh, will be um, having the, the, the chat line um, open, but there's no opportunity for a Q&A. However, we will be recording any questions that you uh, put into the chat line. And because we know who you are, uh, we will get back to you um, with some answers. So uh, there won't be a QA and a at the end, but we will be taking note of questions coming in. Well, this morning represents the culmination of, in fact, years of work. As an SMA 2020, we've made use of time series that were started, in some cases, many, many years ago. SMA 2020 presents the current state of our seas and is in fact the third in a series of publications. But more about that in a moment. I'm very pleased to say that the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Ms Cunningham, has kindly recorded a message. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Ms Cunningham. Good afternoon. Um, I really um, uh, I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to record this message for you. It's a pleasure to join you all today to announce the launch of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. I'm sorry, obviously, that I can't join you live, but I am nevertheless delighted uh, to be here. As you know, I'm passionate about Scotland's seas and coasts, Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. Uh, provides a robust evidence base that we can use to help us to protect and enhance our marine environment while we support building a sustainable blue economy. It's therefore with very great pleasure that I can formally announce the exciting publication of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. This assessment provides an up-to-date review of the current state of Scotland's seas, updating Scotland's Marine Atlas published in 2011. It's a peer-reviewed scientific assessment and it's a culmination of over two years' work undertaken by Marine Scotland, Nature Scott, SEPA, the JNCC and, of course, the academic community. It has resulted in a robust and comprehensive assessment that will be available via a Scottish Government website portal. It reports on how well we are achieving our vision for clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas and will provide a strong foundation for us to manage our seas to meet the long-term needs of both nature and people. Scotland has seas that are amongst the world's richest, most productive and biologically diverse. As well as being biologically important, our seas and coasts are home to many essential marine industries that support and sustain communities around Scotland. The publication of this assessment brings together a wide range of data on the marine environment and the activities that take place there. It provides a comprehensive look at our seas from rare species of plants and animals to the value generated by marine industries as diverse as aquaculture and tourism. It has 66 assessments in all, and these take in a broad sweep of topics ranging from physical characteristics, clean and safe, healthy and biologically diverse, productive, to climate change, ecosystem services, pressure from activities and managing human activities. And there's also a regional assessment for each of the 21 regions into which the Scottish seas have been divided. In this way, uh, the marine assessment sets out the condition of Scotland's seas and the pressures that they face. In turn, this will help the government support nature conservation, marine planning and marine management, forming a vital building block for our Blue Economy Action Plan and an essential tool that we will use to protect and, and enhance our marine environment for future generations. And the assessment has a number of headlines which make clear that we are making good progress in a number of areas as well as identifying a number of challenges to be addressed. We have reason for optimism in a number of areas. The assessment has found that progress is being made in improving the state of Scotland's seas, especially in relation to contaminants, 
Thus, eutrophication is generally not an issue in our seas. And the marine economy continues to provide, to provide an enormous contribution to Scotland's social and economic well-being. The latest data shows that this was worth £14.7 billion gross value added in 2017, flowing from sectors such as energy, food production, transport, sport, leisure and recreation. And in particular, the assessment has identified developments in the contributions made by marine renewable energy generation, wind, wave and tidal, marine tourism and aquaculture. And this shows the growing importance of these marine industries to the Scottish economy. But also highlighted in the assessment are the challenges, including increasing pressures associated with climate change, non-native species, ocean acidification and some human activities. Climate change obviously is a critical factor affecting Scotland's marine environment. The impacts are already being seen across the Scottish marine ecosystem. For example, mean sea level around the coast is rising, increasing the risk of coastal flooding and coastal erosion, and a rise in sea temperature is causing changes in species distributions. Climate change is very much a global emergency and Scotland will continue to play its part in the global solution that is necessary to address it. Our seas are also very productive. They provide us with food to eat, both wild and farmed, as well as energy. They are, there are, however, pressures associated with all of these activities, and those pressures do need to be addressed. The collection of wide-ranging evidence and the findings in the assessment can now be utilised to inform our future policies. Indeed, we've already used the assessment to help inform the future fisheries management strategy, which will ensure that this sector is managed in a way which enables it to grow sustainably. The assessment will also inform our review of Scotland's National Marine Plan, the development of the Blue Economy Action Plan and the further work to be done on the Marine Protected Area Network. So it underpins a lot of the other work that we are also doing. Data is a vital component of any assessment and it's important that data continues to be collected to enable us to monitor the future health of our seas. And this work also reflects the value in partnerships such as those formed to produce this assessment as well as the vital importance of collaboration with coastal communities and international partners. To conclude, we are clearly in a time of significant change and uncertainty, but also of great opportunity. Scotland has long been looked to as a global leader in matters marine, in driving forward environmental protection and in our ambitious climate change and renewable energy targets. We are committed to protecting and managing our seas to meet the needs of nature and people now and into the future. So Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 is a truly impressive piece of work which will provide us with a tremendous foundation providing the best possible evidence base for achieving our commitments. I'd finally like to take this opportunity to recognise and acknowledge the commitment and input from a wide range of people throughout the development of this assessment. The completion of the assessment is an excellent example of collaboration with more than 200 individuals, four statutory organisations and many colleagues from the academic community under the umbrella of the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for Scotland, which most of us will know as MASTS, working together over a two year period on a common goal to deliver a product which I believe is set to serve Scotland and its marine environment extremely well in the years ahead. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cunningham, for your message. And it's really encouraging to hear that she's passionate about Scotland's seas and coasts. And I can assure you from conversations I've had with Ms. Cunningham that she is very much um, passionate about ensuring that our seas and coasts and the human activities that are impacting on them are, are managed in a very sustainable manager, uh, a sustainable way uh, for the future. So um, I'm Colin Moffat, I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor Marine to Scottish Government and I've had the privilege of leading the production of Scotland's Mean Assessment 2020 over the last uh, couple of years. Now in a few minutes uh, you're going to hear from lead authors on the contents of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. However, just before that perhaps a wee bit of background. As I said at the start, SMA 2020 is part of a series. It is in fact the third joint assessment 
the first being Scotland Seas Towards Understanding Their State, and this was published in 2008. This was followed in 2011 by Scotland's Marine Atlas, information uh, for the National Marine Plan. Now, just as the Atlas was a very different format to the first publication, so Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 is a very different presentation uh, to the Atlas. It's primarily an online uh, presentation. In addition, there's a greater emphasis on topics such as climate change, natural capital, ecosystem services, and the blue economy, while industries such as renewable energy also feature more prominently. However, there is a continuity of presentation around reporting on the delivery of the vision that uh, we have for Scotland Seas. This means that clean and safe, healthy and biologically diverse, productive and physical characteristics are yet again how we brigade the vision assessments. Several of these vision assessments follow on from the Atlas, but others are new. For example, underwater noise, while there are a number of new biological indicators. Now, new for 2020 are the Scottish marine regions and offshore marine regions, 21 geographic areas against which reporting has been made uh, where this is possible uh, or indeed appropriate. So where have these regions come from? Well, uh, the Atlas was produced as an evidence base for the development of Scotland's National Marine Plan. And when the National Marine Plan was published in 2015, the plan outlined the 11 Scottish marine regions. The 10 offshore marine regions were then developed by, by Marine Scotland to provide cover across Scotland's 462,000 square kilometres of sea area within our Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, uh, with the additional 156,481 square kilometres of seabed and subsoil to the west of uh, the EEZ being named Hatton. SMA 2020, like the Atlas before it, has a direct link to the National Marine Plan. In this case, under the Marine Scotland Act 2010, there's a requirement to prepare an assessment of the condition of the Scottish marine area in, an advan in advance of a review of Scotland's National Marine Plan in 2021. SMA 2020 is that assessment. There's also a requirement under the Act to prepare a summary of the significant pressures and the impact of human activity on an area or region. Now, this is the first bespoke attempt at such an assessment across all 21 marine regions. And you'll hear more about that from Phil Bullcott in a few moments. What has been gathered together is a robust set of assessments, case studies and topics, all of which have been the subject of both internal review and, very importantly, external peer review. I'd have to say that the peer reviewers were extremely thorough and provided many helpful comments that we've taken into account when finalizing SMA 2020. Indeed, on the portal, you'll find a summary of the, the key outcomes from the peer review, particularly with respect to the set of eight questions that we asked to be considered when assessing the work. You'll also find a short response from the Scottish Seas Data and Assessment Group, the group that oversaw the production of SMA uh, 2020 uh, to these key outcomes. Now, in addition to the topics that will be covered by the lead authors in a few minutes, SMA 2020 through its introduction and through the section on managing the human activities that have an impact in Scotland's seas provides a range of information around who does what, as well as national and international collaborations. Indeed, we've attempted to provide some simplified diagrams to help people navigate through what is quite a complex web of relationships, organizations, and collaborations. We will, in early 2021, present information in SMA 2020 in a slightly different way when we add the regional assessments uh, to the portal. However, 
before then, there's lots and lots and lots to digest. Whether it's the 10 headline messages, the 11 next steps, the eight future challenges, the 66 vision assessments, the 36 case studies, 21 pressure assessments, 19 climate assessments, or the 12 ecosystem service assessments, all in full technicolor, you just have to choose and dive in. Look out specifically for the Scottish Blue Economy hexagons and the UN Sustainable Goal icons. And you can feast your eyes on the carousels of pictures in the ecosystem assessments chapter. So, to whet your appetite, there will now be seven short presentations covering the various topics in SME 2020, after which uh, we will hear from the Head of Marine Planning and Policy for Scottish Government, Mike Palmer. Then, yes, the SME 2020 video will premiere, after which I'll be back. Hello, my name is Bea Burks and I'm a Physical Oceanographer and Climate Change Science Lead at Marine Scotland. Today, I'll give a brief overview of the Climate Change section on Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 portal. I would first like to take a moment to acknowledge the other contributors and thank them for their work on this assessment. This section includes 19 assessments. These can be grouped into four topics on the changes in the ocean climate, the biological impacts of climate change, how climate change has an impact on the blue economy, and how the marine environment and activities within it can provide opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from human activities. Apart from a few, the assessments all follow the same structure. They highlight why something is important, why they highlight what is already happening and what will likely happen in future due to climate change. So how do we know the Earth's climate is changing and that this is due to human greenhouse gas emissions? Our burning of fossil fuels and changes to land use have led to an increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which through the greenhouse gas effect have increased global temperature. The global average temperature now is 0.8 degrees Celsius warmer than at the start of the 20th century. And we know that 90% of this excess energy has been absorbed by the ocean. Changes in the ice sheets and increased ocean heat content have led to an average increase in sea level by around 2.5 millimeters per year since satellite measurements began. In Scottish waters, we are all also already seeing changes. We have already observed um, warming and that the warming trend in the last 30 years has been higher than the long-term average. Mean sea level around the Scottish coast has increased and will continue to do so due to climate change. By changes in ocean temperatures and stratification, the oxygen concentrations are also decreasing and globally the ocean has absorbed around a quarter of human carbon dioxide emissions this has led to a reduction in ocean pH. Measurements in Scottish waters have shown that the pH is variable year to year and through the seasons, but these time series are not yet long enough to detect a trend. The impacts of climate change are seen in a wide range of species, from the microscopic to the charismatic, and in a wide range of habitats, from our coasts to the deep sea. These changes include shifts in spatial distribution of species, the timing of life events in, their, in different species, such as hatching and spawning, and also in adult body size of several species of fish. Changes between the physical environment, individual organisms, their populations, and the food webs they form part of are all linked, and understanding these linkages will be important for us to understand how future climate change will have an effect on different species. Climate change will also have an impact on many of the sectors that use our marine space. The warming temperatures and decreases in pH and dissolved oxygen will impact the productivity of our fisheries and aquaculture sectors. And changes to extreme weather events such as storms 
and sea level rise will also have an impact, for example, on shipping and infrastructure close to the coast. Finally, we can and must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There are opportunities in the marine environment to support our transition to net zero. Marine renewable energy developments will help reduce emissions from energy generation and carbon capture, utilisation and storage will also be needed to ensure we meet these net zero targets. Similar to how trees and peatland do on land, several marine habitats such as merle, salt marsh and seagrass take up and store carbon from the marine environment and provide a natural way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. To conclude, I have only managed to highlight a few results from the assessment and at a very high level. I hope you find time to visit the portal and find out more detail of the different climate change assessments. Many thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Bee Burks and I'm a physical oceanographer and climate change science lead at Marine Scotland. Today, I'll give you a brief overview of the physical characteristics and ocean acidification section of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 portal. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the other contributors and thank them for their work in bringing this assessment together. In total, there are eight assessments and four case studies as part of the physical characteristics and ocean acidification part on the portal. These assessments provide information on the temperature and salinity of Scotland's seas, the ocean circulation, tides, sea level and wave climate the stratification and turbidity of the water column, and ocean acidification. As part of the clean and safe section, there is also a dissolved oxygen assessment, which is linked to in this part of the portal too. The four case studies include three on the impacts of changes in carbonate chemistry on marine species, and one on the use of new technologies called ocean gliders to study dissolved oxygen in the North Sea. I will now show a few key highlights in these assessments. The temperature assessment includes information on the long-term trend in sea surface temperature across all marine regions. This is shown here on this map. These trends show that since the late 1800s, temperatures have on average increased by between 0 0.02 and 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per decade. In the last 30 years, these changes have been much higher and the year-to-year -year variability in temperatures is also large. The adjacent Atlantic Ocean is an important influence on the circulation and water masses in Scottish waters. The circulation map is shown here on the left. The circulation assessment provides an overview of this and salinity is a property where this influence is most evident. And in the salinity assessment, we document how salinities have changed in the main water bodies that flow around the Scottish coasts. This is shown here on the right. These include the Atlantic water and coastal waters in the Northern North Sea and the Atlantic water masses in the Faroe Shetland Channel. When looking at the salinity variability in these water masses, as shown on this graph, they are shown as anomalies from a long-term average and normalized by standard deviation so we can see common patterns of variability. In the most recent five years, these water masses have been relatively fresh, and this has been due to changes at the entire basin scale of the North Atlantic Ocean. The final highlight I wanted to share with you today is from the Ocean Acidification Assessment. Stonehaven off the Ab Aberdeenshire coast was the only measurement site in Scottish waters where observations of carbonate chem chemistry, including derived pH, are available. The results show a strong seasonal cycle and year-to-year -year measurements are very variable. Two of the case studies show how changes in carbonate chemistry at Stonehaven impact shell-forming organisms. In order to establish long-term trends in seawater pH and distinguish from the this natural variability from the climate change signal, the time series need to be much longer. I have only managed to highlight a few results from the assessment and I hope you will find time to visit the portal and the physical characteristics and ocean acidification section 
to find out more. Understanding our physical environment requires continued ocean observations of the right things at the right time, place and frequency. We also need to continue to expand our understanding of how these conditions in part determine the year-to-year -year and long-term changes that we observe in the marine ecosystem. Many thanks for listening. I would like to give a very quick overview of the healthy and biologically diverse assessment. But first, I would like to acknowledge and thank all those uh, involved in this endeavour. It has been a huge collaborative effort involving too many people to mention by name from a range of organisations, including government departments, agencies, the whole mass and others. Scotland sees support over 6,500 species and a wide range of different habitats, from the intertidal to the deep ocean seabed. With such a variety of habitats and species, it is impossible to assess everything. The assessment that is being presented is based on three themes, species, habitats and conservation, and includes 16 specific assessments and 18 case studies. Each theme is divided into a number of sub-themes. The species theme comprises six sub-themes, mammals, birds, fish, shellfish and other invertebrates, plankton and non-native species. The habitats theme comprises three sub-themes, the deep sea, the pelagic environment and the intertidal and continental shelf. The conservation theme, finally, is explored through two sub-themes, marine protected areas and, and priority marine features. Scotland is blessed with a long history of marine exploration, survey and research, and inevitably we know more about some things than others. For example, seabirds and seals, but less about the deep sea, seabed, and the, the animals and plants that live in the deep ocean. Long time series of data are there, but incredibly valuable. Overall, the picture is a mixed one. For the number of species, there are a few or no concerns for their status and trends, including various cetaceans, waterfowl and waders, commercial shellfish, etc although for some of these there are at least some local concerns. For the other species, such as harbour seals and seabirds, there are some concerns and more local concerns. With seabirds, some species are doing well, whilst others are declining. Similarly, harbour seals in some Scottish marine regions are declining, whilst in others, they are showing signs of an increasing trend. Then there are some species and habitats for which there are many concerns, such as seafloor habitats, plankton, salmon and sea trout, and biogenic habitats such as mussel beds, merl beds, and flame shell beds. Finally, there are other features where it is not possible at the moment to provide an assessment of their trend or status due to a lack of evidence or good assessed criteria. So in summary, we have a mixed picture. There are some encouraging signs where things are improving but we cannot afford to be complacent. There are many challenges ahead, both in terms of reversing declining trends but also in obtaining the necessary data to enable us to identify the problem areas and come up with the solutions. Throughout this assessment, we have focused on Scotland seas, but we cannot ignore that they are but a tiny part, around 0.1, not 0.13% of a global ocean ecosystem. 
and if we are to address the issues facing Scotland's seas, we need to do it in collaboration with others and see the bigger picture. The wildfowl and waders that come to our shores to overwinter breed in more northern climes. The basking sharks that spend summer off the west coast of Scotland are known to travel over 3,000 kilometres south in the winter. And then there is the Arctic tern that migrates all the way to Antica. We ignore Scotland's seas at our peril. Progress is being made in the protection and sustainable exploitation of this resource, but more still needs to be done. Hi, I'm Linda Webster from Marine Scotland Science and I'm the Clean and Safe Lead. I will briefly outline the key messages from the Clean and Safe topic, which covered five main areas. Eutrophication, which had four assessments and two case studies. Hazardous substances and effects, which had 11 assessments and four case studies. Marine litter, which had three assessments and two case studies. Microbiology and algal toxins, which had three assessments. And noise, two assessments. There are multiple organisations and people involved in this including Marine Scotland, CEPA, Food Standards Scotland, SAMS, Aberty University and Harry Oort University. Eutrophication was assessed using nutrient inputs, chlorophyll concentrations, winter nutrient concentrations and dissolved oxygen. Assessments were at scale of Scottish marine regions. Highest nutrient inputs were in the most populated areas including the Clyde, the Forth and Tay and the Murray Firth. Winter nutrient concentrations and chlorophyll concentrations in all SMRs were below the OSPAR assessment criteria and were relatively stable. Dissolved oxygen concentrations were above levels required to maintain healthy marine ecosystems, except for one water body in the Inner Clyde. Overall, eutrophication not, is not an issue in Scottish marine regions. So hazardous substances and biological effects were measured in sediment and biota. For hazardous substances, we looked at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, including pH biometabolites, polychlorinated biphenols, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, and heavy metals mercury, cadmium, and lead. For effects, we looked at external fish disease, which is used as an indicator of the general health status of fish, EROD, which is used as an indicator of exposure to contaminants, and IMPOSEX, which is used as an indicator of exposure to tributyl tin. And these were assessed at the scale of the Scottish biogeographic regions which included the Northern North Sea, the Irish Sea, the Minches in Western Scotland and the Scottish Continental Sea. So contaminant concentrations were generally above background but below concentrations where adverse effects occur. Exceedances were mainly in the industrialised areas of the Clyde and the Forth. Lead and mercury and sediment and PCBs and sediment and biota were unacceptable at some stations. And concentrations were stable or declining for all hazardous substances and effects measured. Biological effects showed limited exposure to contaminants and the fish health status was satisfactory, although in the Northern North Sea there was an increase in some years. So for marine litter, we looked at seafloor litter and microplastics in surface water and beach litter. Litter is present in all areas, however there are no assessment criteria available for status assessments. Most Scottish marine regions and offshore marine regions had low concentrations of microplastics less than 5,000 microparticles per kilometre squared. Higher concentrations were found in the Clyde, Solway, the Forth and Tay and Argyle. Seafloor litter was highest in the North Sea, and downward trends in the Scottish continental shelf and Atlantic Northwest approaches were seen. Beach litter was highest in the Forth Harbours and lowest in Orkney, and plastic bags and plastic bottles are decreasing in all areas. So E. coli was assessed in bathing waters, an excellent classification increased from 16 in 2015 to 28 in 2018. The microbiological quality of shellfish production areas also showed an improvement with 59% of shellfish growing waters achieving the highest classification. Some marine algae produce biotoxins that contaminate bivalve molecules such as, such as mussels and oysters. From biotoxin monitoring in 2010 and 2018 were above allowable levels in 1,793 shellfish samples, which resulted in closure of shellfish harvesting sites. So there's currently very little data for noise, but assessments were done of continuous impulsive noise. There's the potential for underwater noise from human sources to have negative effects on marine mammals. 
There are no assessment criteria for status assessment and not enough data to carry out any trend assessments. However, there was a continuous noise data collected in 2013 and 2014 as part of the East Coast Marine Mammal Acoustic Study. Overall, continuous noise levels at each site were similar. Impulsive noise may increase in some areas due to offshore wind farm construction work. Hello, I'm Venetia Hines, a statistician from Marine Scotland, and I'm the topic lead for the productive part of the marine assessment. Scotland's vision for the seas is that they are, they are economically productive and that marine industries are sustainable. I'm going to briefly outline the background and the key messages uh, from the productive topic in this assessment. In this productive topic, we are focusing on economically productive marine industries. The Scottish marine environment is used by a wide range of industries. Some, like fishing and aquaculture, rely directly on the marine environment. Others, like offshore renewables, marine transportation and subsea cables, rely on it indirectly. We have included all industries that rely either directly or indirectly on the marine environment. The economic productivity of these industries has been measured using gross value added, employment and in the absence of these, a range of other economic measures. Gross value added is the value of goods and services produced minus the cost of raw materials and other inputs used to produce them. The main source for the data used in these productive assessments is the Scottish Annual Business Statistics publication, which also provides most of the information for the Marine Economic Statistics publication. The overall marine economy gross value added, including oil and gas extraction, was 14.7 billion in 2017. This is a decrease of 22% from 2013. However, it is still an important part of Scotland's overall economy, as the overall marine economy makes up 11% of Scotland's economy. In total, there are 14 assessments and six case studies within the productive topic. The assessments cover a wide range of industries. Some, like oil and gas, are well established and are in long term decline. Others, including marine tourism, and aquaculture are increasing productivity. New and developing industries like renewables and carbon capture, utilisation and storage are predicted to increase and may take over from oil and gas. Unfortunately, there is limited data for the, most of the new and developing industries, so exact levels of growth and contribution to the economy cannot be estimated. Some of the key messages from the productive assessment are shown here. Despite being in long-term decline, the oil and gas sector remains the biggest contributor to the marine economy, representing two-thirds of the entire marine sector gross value added in 2017. Between 2013 and 2017, aquaculture gross value added increased by 58% to 354 million. Between 2008 and 2017, marine tourism gross value added increased by 28% and employment by 16%. Of all the marine industries, marine tourism employed the largest number of people, a third of all marine employment. However, as this is a headcount, many will be part-time or seasonal. Between 2014 and 2018, offshore renewable, marine renewable energy generation increased by 142%. The weight of freight handled by all Scottish ports fell by 9% between 2014 and 2018. In contrast to the fall in freight, ferry passenger numbers increased by 6% to 10.3 billion between 2014 and 2018. Among the other industries included in the productive assessment are fishing, fish processing, seaweed harvesting and cultivation and military activity. For a full list of all the industries covered in this assessment, please refer to the portal. Where available data exists, information has been provided at Scotland level and Scottish Marine Region level. 
There is more information available for some industries than others. In general, well-established industries have the most available information. In cases where data is not available at Scottish Marine Region level, local authority or other regional breakdowns have been provided. In some cases, the small scale of an industry prevents detailed geographical information being produced. In other cases, sub-Scotland level data for some industries is just not collected. For more detailed information, please refer to the individual topic assessment pages on the portal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katie Gillam and I'm the Head of Marine Ecosystems at Nature Scott and I'm going to talk to you about the Natural Capital Ecosystem Services and the Blue Economy part of Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020. And the picture that we've got here is of a mole bed and I'll come back to that later in the presentation. When I talk to people about ecosystem services and natural capital, often one of the first questions is, what are they? So I've included definitions uh, here on either side of the diagram, but I really am going to focus in on the diagram itself, which is intended to represent the benefits that we get from Scotland Seas. Um, and we split that up into four categories of provisioning services, such as the fish and the shellfish that we eat, cultural services, such as the, the knowledge that we get from our seas and the health and well-being. The regulating functions such as storm protection and climate and temperature regulation, which are obviously very topical now, um, and the supporting services, which are more of the invisible ones that don't really get seen, but are nonetheless really crucial. So things like nutrient cycling and, and water cycling too. This slide has come from Marine Scotland and uh, shows the work that they're doing at the moment on the Blue Economy Action Plan. Um, and I think really the main thing to highlight here is the links between the blue economy and the sustainable use of our oceans, how that then links into our economy, livelihoods and jobs, and how that was all is underpinned by the health of our ocean, ocean ecosystem. And I think the key thing really in terms of unlocking opportunities and actually um, showing that development in, in terms of our sustainable use of our seas is, is really kind of where are the opportunities to join up, not just across Scottish government and other government bodies, but across marine industries and across coastal communities and other interests too, um, to make sure that we're able to uh, collaboratively look at these uh, shared challenges that we're all facing. This slide shows the themes um, that sit under the ecosystem services assessment. And it's really quite broad as you'd expect, uh, given the benefits that we do get from our seas. So ranging from the physical and chemical environment through to the work that's been done on Scotland's marine protected area network and the, the social attitudes work that's been done more recently recognizing um, how people feel about Scotland's seas and how they relate to it. On this slide, I've just got a few of the headline facts uh, that have come from the assessment itself. And these range from things like coastal defence, sea fisheries, uh, the production of oxygen that we get from some of the microscopic uh, plankton that lives in our seas, um, the benefits that we get to aquaculture, so relating to mussel farming actually being reliant on the plankton that we get from our seas, um, and also the really increasing importance to our economy of marine tourism. I said I'd also come back to the mole beds uh, picture that I showed on the front slide. Um, and we've got the fat second from the bottom there about juvenile queen scallops. Um, and in some of the research that we've been involved with, it's shown that these have a strong preference for the live mole beds. Um, so just emphasizing the, the importance of the healthy ocean ecosystem for underpinning our, our sustainable use of our seas. And to summarise, really, although the concepts of natural capital and ecosystem services have been around for quite a long time, it still feels as if we're quite at an early stage of actually embedding that thinking and those concepts into um, methods and approaches that allow us to take them into account in our policy setting, in our decision making. Um, so we're clear that there are real benefits to people from the natural environment and the processes that support it. Um, but if we're to continue to receive those benefits from Scotland Seas, um, you know, there is going to need to be continued management of human activities so that we don't exceed nature's capacity to provide those benefits. And in some cases, we may want to look at recovery as well. Um, and if human impact activities have impacted um, on our environment, if we want to continue to see those uh, benefits, we might need to put management in place to, to actually facilitate that recovery. So thanks very much. 
Hello, I'm Phil Bulcock from Marine Scotland Science and I have the very great pleasure of introducing you to the pressures from activities assessment set out within the Scottish Marine Atlas 2020. The aim of this assessment was to identify the top five pressure causing activities in each of the 21 Scottish or offshore marine regions. The assessment itself is accessed within the topics page of the Scottish Marine Assessment. Within the assessments page, you'll find general background, a note to processes, and the assessments themselves. Assessing the main pressure causing activities was a three stage process. First, the activities in each region are identified, and then the associated pressures determined. Second, the pressures are initially ranked within expert groups utilising all available data such as vessel monitoring data and marine licensing data. And third, the assessment results are the subject of a wider consensus building exercise between experts. The first stage was to identify the activities taking place in each region. These regions are shown in the map. Identifying what activities take place and where was carried out by an initial working group using Marine Scotland's National Marine Plan Interactive Tool. This mapping tool maps the occurrence of activities to geographical locations. In this instance, you can see that the data relating to the sighting of finfish farms are being displayed. The next step was to derive the pressures arising from these activities. The relevant pressures were identified using the Feature Activity Sensitivity Tool, or FEAST. FEAST has been developed jointly by Nature Scott, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee and Marine Scotland, and uses a defined set of activities. Relevant pressures can be listed for each activity, as seen here for finfish aquaculture. An updated version of the marine pressure list was created during 2019 as part of ongoing redevelopment of FEAST and for use in this assessment. Once we have these list of pressures, the second stage in the process was to rank them. To carry out this process, we drew upon the mass community within Scotland. The ranking process for the 21 regions was split across five expert groups. These experts had a broad range of interests that aligned well with the regions assigned to them and they were brigaded under the leadership of an expert with specific knowledge of the geographic area. To help the expert groups organise their thoughts and to provide standardisation, they were asked to work within the format of a prioritisation table that clearly defined criteria associated with the pressures. An example of the prioritisation table used by the expert groups is shown here. For those who have an interest, the full details of the prioritisation process can be found on the portal. Once this table was complete for every region, the third and final stage of the process took place at a one-day workshop in Glasgow as part of the Mass Annual Science Meeting on October 2019. You can see here the off-shelf expert group working on the four regions assigned to them. The objective of the workshop was to allow the five groups to meet and to complete the pressure assessment exercise for all 21 regions using a consensus approach. This approach allowed us to confirm the five main pressures having an impact within a new region and to discuss a five-year pressure trend, if one could be identified, and to make the necessary links to the source human activity. The results of this expert workshop can be found in the 21 assessments, one for each of the Scottish marine regions or offshore marine regions. Taking the Clyde as an example, you can see this assessment has a summary of the pressures and activities taking place within the region, the five 
pressures identified and also the contributing activities to these pressures. So what do these assessments look like? Well, I'd encourage you to go and look at the assessments online, as summarising results for 21 different regions is not an easy task. This table attempts to do just that, and is a little cluttered because of it. But if I recolour just five of these 29 listed pressures red, what is apparent is that these five pressures dominate the assessments. They are the removal of target species and non-target species, surface and subsurface abrasion, and physical change of the seabed. These are the pressures with strong associations to commercial fishing. Although we must note that pressures are different from impact, for that we'd need some idea of the sensitivity of the biological features, it is clear from this assessment that fishing, due to the size of its geographical footprint and the nature of the activity, is the dominant pressure-causing activity in the marine environment. And I'd like to just finish by thanking you for listening and to thank the expert groups en masse for their participation in the assessments. Hello, my name is Mike Palmer and I'm the Deputy Director uh, for Marine Planning and Policy in Marine Scotland. Um, and I'm just going to say a few words about how we use and will use the SMA 2020 uh, to inform policy uh, going forward. Um, and I should say, to begin with, that we have for a long time uh, recognised uh, the importance of the interplay between uh, the science base in Scotland um, and the development of policy. Uh, it, within Marine Scotland itself, we have a very integrated function uh, where we have uh, policy working extremely closely with Marine Scotland science. And we also have for a long time worked in very close collaboration on the policy side with organisations beyond Marine Scotland in MASTS, Nature Scott, JNCC and SEPA. And that collaboration is really been reflected in spades by uh, the wonderful uh, product that we now see before us, uh, which is the result of so much uh, cooperation and joint effort uh, between so many individuals across all of those organisations. And I'm just going to say something very obvious here, which is that uh, policy and the way that we make policy is evidence based. It must be evidence based. That is good quality policy. Um, and we've worked in that way for a long time. And Colin said a few words at the outset about the history of previous assessments. Uh, and some colleagues have mentioned uh, Scotland's Marine Atlas, which was the last time that we brought together such an assessment of Scotland's seas back in 2011. Um, and that has proven its worth for people like me who work in the policy world um, uh, uh, over the years. Um, we have referred to um, that uh, Marine Atlas time and time again um, when we're thinking about uh, the policies um, on which we advise ministers and the future direction of policy. But SMA 2020 really takes us so much further and is such a move on from the Atlas, which itself was a remarkable milestone. We've now got another uh, amazing product in front of us today. Um, uh, it's so comprehensive, it encompasses so many uh, different variables and factors. Um, what it says about climate change, about human activity, about the range of marine biodiversity, um, and the application of the marine regions. These are wonderful developments for somebody like me working in a policy job advising ministers. This is gold dust. This is 
really fundamental to informing uh, the policy thinking and development that need, we need to do with ministers uh, to uh, ad advance Scotland's seas in a way that protects the natural environment within Scotland's seas, but can also support sustainable economic activity dependent upon those seas. And in policy terms, I just want to say a few words about what's coming up in the year ahead. Um, and just to mention a few of the big policy developments where I can absolutely see SMA 2020 is going to play a pivotal role. Uh, so the, the first thing to say is that um, we are seeing 2021 as the super year of biodiversity. Now, we were saying a year ago that 2020 was going to be the super year of bio, for biodiversity. Um, that didn't quite happen because with the pandemic, um, a number of really big milestones uh, didn't, didn't get to happen this year, but they are going to happen next year, uh, uh, we hope. Um, so we have COP15 coming along uh, around the middle of next year. That's going to be followed towards the end of next year by COP26. These are massive, extremely important international um, events which are going to uh, take us on the next step of the journey in terms of how we tackle and respond to the challenges uh, of biodiversity, both terrestrially and in the marine sphere, and also how we respond to the climate emergency. And SMA 2020 is fantastic because for policy people like myself in the Scottish Government, it's providing me and my colleagues with this platform of evidence and assessment uh, that is going to help inform uh, the, the positions that we feed in with our UK colleagues um, and, and the thoughts and, and, and the policy priorities that we develop as we prepare for those COPs uh, and as we work with other countries across the world uh, to develop a new set of targets around biodiversity and climate change. And so in, in a very small way, because Scotland is only a tiny part of the global picture, um, I think SMA 2020 is, is going to play a part in all of that. Second thing coming up next year that I want to mention is the review of the National Marine Plan. Uh, so by the end of March next year, uh, we will have completed our review of the current National Marine Plan for Scotland. And ministers will take a decision as to what they feel needs to be done as a result of that review. And there's a whole range of different scenarios that could result from that. They could decide to uh, develop a totally new National Marine Plan, uh, or they could decide uh, to adjust the current plan. Whatever the outcome, the advice that we put to ministers and the thinking that is done around that is now going to be very heavily informed by this wonderful product that we have, SMA 2020, which is giving us um, such a fabulous suite of information and assessment right across the marine sphere. The third thing that I want to mention about next year is about one specific aspect of uh, human activity um, on our seas. And I'm really just pulling this out for illustration, but it, it's also a very important development, I think, uh, which is going to be uh, more and more significant as we go forward. And this is to do with marine renewable energy, uh, which is one of the newer industries being developed in Scotland's seas. Uh, you may have heard about the commitments that have been made in the offshore wind policy statement that the Scottish Government recently released. 
talking about uh, developing 11 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy in offshore wind in Scottish waters by 2030. That is potentially a transformative increase in renewable energy. It will clearly be a major contrib contribution to be made to how we tackle the climate emergency within Scotland. But that's also going to have a massive implication for the use of Scotland's seas. And what we need to do in the policy world is to be able to advise ministers on how we can manage the various different uh, types of human activity uh, in Scotland's seas, while we can also protect and conserve the wonderful natural marine environment uh, that exists within our waters. And SMA 2020 is going to be tremendously helpful for us in, uh, in, in, in helping us do that job. And uh, at the end of March next year, the Scott Wind leasing round for offshore renewable wind energy is going to complete. And there will be some big uh, proposals, I would expect, coming in from offshore wind developers uh, uh, for putting uh, uh, wind farms into Scottish waters in assessing the impact of those farms um, and how uh, we can uh, enable the development of offshore wind developments in a way that coexists harmoniously with um, other activity and what we need to do to conserve the natural capital in Scotland's seas. We're going to be using SMA 2020 to help us in all of that thinking. And the fourth thing that I just wanted to mention uh, that, that will be a big feature of the policy world next year for us will be the development of the Blue Economy Action Plan. It was mentioned by Katie uh, previously um, in this programme of presentations. And I just want to emphasise um, a couple of things about that. Um, and the first thing is that when we talk about the blue economy, we are very clear in Marine Scotland, and, and I know our partners in other bodies who have collaborated with SMA 2020 are equally clear about this, that our definition of blue economy is not just about the hard kind of financial economy of marine industries, important that they are, and they are very important, and we need to support their sustainable growth going forward. But it's not only about the hard financial definition of economy, it's about that wider ecosystem services concept of the marine economy. Uh, and it's about the natural capital that we have in our wonderfully rich waters and how we can work with that natural capital in order in a holistic fashion to be good stewards of the marine environment and Scottish waters in a way that through being good stewards of that natural capital, we are able to support sustainable marine industries and sustainable human activity that can coexist with that natural capital and build on it in a, in a productive, sustainable way. Um, and the Blue Economy Action Plan is definitely an instrument of policy that we are developing within that general concept. And for example, just to take one example of one of the strands of that action plan that we're taking forward at the moment, and this is again just an illustration, uh, we are developing the Scottish Marine Environmental Enhancement Fund, the SMEF for short is the acronym. Um, this fund is a fund that we are looking to engage a whole range of marine industries in to see uh, if they would be able to contribute to a pot of investment in a collaborative fashion 
that could be used to enhance the marine environment upon which all of those marine industries depend for their success and their sustainability. And that's a very good reflection, I think, of the collaborative joined up approach that we want to develop in the Blue Economy Action Plan. And again, I think SMA 2020 is going to be a fantastic platform that we can use to enhance, to, to inform, for example, the kinds of projects and priorities that we would want to set in terms of where we might invest funds uh, to enhance uh, Scotland's marine environment um, through that fund. So just to finish up, uh, from me, I just really want to say that this is a, um, a wonderful instrument, the SMA 2020, for policy folk like me and my colleagues. Um, I want to make it clear that SMA 2020 um, has been socialised, as, as we say in the jargon these days, across the policy functions within Marine Scotland. Um, and it is something that my colleagues across a number of different divisions within Marine Scotland going beyond science and deep into policy, they are aware of it, they will engage with it, they will use it to inform their thinking. Um, and our policies are going to be that much stronger as a result of it. Um, and I just want to say uh, alongside a number of others who presented this morning, a very big thank you. Um, incredibly grateful to the hundreds of individuals who have contributed to this product. I think Scotland can be proud, and particularly the Scottish science base can be proud of the product that we have before us today. I think it's something that, that is of international prominence in terms of what has been delivered. Um, and it just reflects the strength of the collaboration that we have uh, within uh, Scotland. Um, and um, uh, it's going to be a wonderful thing for policy people like me to be able to work with next year and for many years to come. That's all from me. Thank you very much. stuff. Hopefully this has excited you and that you're all now eager to spend time on the portal. You've seen the maps of the Scottish marine regions and the offshore marine regions. You've been given insight into the, the main outcomes and you have some idea of the magnificent images that are of course all from Scotland's marine environment. One thing you should look out for early in 2021 is the SMA 2020 booklet. Uh, this will provide a summary of SMA 2020 and it is a summary that hopefully 
Um, as I go about in 2021, I'll either find it sitting on a desk, or, or at least when I say going about, see them the video for a time. It might be on your coffee table. It might be beside your bed or where you eat your breakfast. Because you can then wake up to SMA 2020 and dip into it. Select a fact for the day, which you can then pass on to your colleagues. As we come to the close of our launch, which is in fact the start of the journey in many ways for SMA 2020, can I firstly thank again the Cabinet Secretary for her opening message. Now, today did not just happen. As I alluded to, there were more than 250 authors contributed to SME 2020. We had the Scottish Seas Data and Assessment Group. We had the group that oversaw the preparation of SME 2020. We had the design team. Uh, we also had the assessment and portal proofreading team. We've had our comms and graphics colleagues working away, including on producing the SMA 2020 video uh, that you've just all seen. All are thanked in the acknowledgement section of SMA 2020, but I'd like to take this opportunity to very publicly express my personal thanks to each and every one of you. It's been a massive undertaking, but I genuinely believe we have moved the story forward and presented a first-class assessment that will inform the review of the National Marine Plan. Of course, I would also like to thank the peer reviewers for their timely and very constructive comments as we progress through the development and finalization of SME 2020. Now I'm pleased to say that Martin Cox, the SME 2020 project manager, has already been very publicly acknowledged when he won the Public Service Award for project management last week. Martin has been the glue that has held us all together and has very adeptly guided us along the path to completion, sometimes with a level of frustration uh, but hopefully more often with a level of joy. Now, although I'm not going to fall into the trap of naming further people, as I'm bound to forget someone, I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues on the Scotland Seas Data and Assessment Group, some, of course, of whom you heard making the presentations earlier. The teamwork and commitment has been tremendous. And I just want to say a huge thank you. Finally, uh, can I thank all of you who are online uh, for joining us uh, this morning, although now it is, of course, afternoon as we passed 12 noon. Can I ask you a favor? Please promote SMA 2020. And the link to the portal, which I'm assured is now live, will appear in the chat box. So Adam, put up the link to the portal. And please be amongst the first to view the portal. Search, explore, and enjoy. Let us know what you think. Send us your comments. And um, we'll see what we can do. When I'm sitting at the top of the cliffs that are just eight minutes from where I'm sitting at the moment, watching the kitty wakes and the guillemots flying around, it is truly magical. In not too many weeks' time, they will start returning from sea. Mating, the eggs will be laid, and the young chicks will be born. To be able to watch that, to be able to experience that is truly phenomenal. And our work today is helping to secure this fundamental ecosystem for future generations.
Thank you. And I hope that you all have a really peaceful Christmas.